I am Miss April. So, you watched our first part of our silhouette tutorials, and now you're ready to learn more. In our last video, we created a simple bookmark. But now, you want to jazz things up a bit. In this video, you will be making bookmark 2.0. Let's get started. And welcome back to the second part of the silhouette tutorial. Let's go over a quick recap of what we went over in the last video. In the last video, we went over the general document uh, management tools. So that is creating a new drawing, opening a project and saving. We also went over the standard editing tools and that is copying, that is cutting, copying and pasting, undoing and redoing. We also went over the zooming tools, so zoom, zooming in, zooming out, zooming in once you drag over a shape. You can also zoom in and out using the mouse and you can pan using the mouse. And if you have zoomed in to a specific part of the drawing space or the image, you can always click fit to window and that will zoom out. So let's try that out really quick, zooming in and then fit to window zooms out. We also went over the quick access toolbar. So this one right here and how to access the store. A little bit about how to set up your library. We went over the drawing tool on the left hand side and some of these on the right hand side, although we'll be going over this in much detail in this video. And we also covered our cutting area and our design space, which is this right here. So in this video, we will be covering the Silhouette Studio tools that are on the right hand side. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to cover is page setup. And you open it by clicking on the page setup panel. And this is the first thing that you will see. So you're gonna see that it says machine, cutting mat, media size, but we're going to stick with the default settings right here. Next, you can open the grid settings. And in the last video, I said that I like having the grid uh, because it just helps me out in thinking about my space and the size of the designs that I have. So I click on show grid and I like putting the divisions to one so that it is a 12 by 12 grid. If you wanted to, you can change the grid lines to another color. So here they are red, pink, black, but I like to keep them at gray. You can also access the registration marks up here. This is mostly for the print and cut projects, but since we won't be doing that for this video, we're just going to skip that part for now. Our next tool is the pick scan tool. If you open the pick scan panel, you would see this. There are two options. You can import from file or you can import from scanner. There's also a special match that you would use for this. Just know that this tool is useful if you want to save paper, but since it's not absolutely necessary for what we're going to be doing in this video, we're just going to exit out. Okay, our next one, we're gonna open the fill panel. So click on that. In the previous video, we used this to fill in our shapes, including our bookmark. So let's take a look at the definition of the fill tool. So close images where the starting point of the line connects with the ending point of the line, including text, images created using the drawing tools, and library images may be altered to have different filled properties. Only closed images may have filled attributes. If the path is broken on any closed images, any applied fill attributes will immediately disappear. So we can break this point right here and the filled attributes now disappears, meaning that it is not filled with any color anymore. So what are the uses for this feature? Well, if you fill it in, this may be helpful to allow you to more easily view different images or image parts and to see shapes and text. 
So as you can see, I have two of the similar shapes. And this one is a lot easier to see because it is filled in. You can change the colors here, change the transparency. You also have the color picker. So if you like this color, it'll change it to that. You can change it to be gradient. or to have a specific fill pattern. Now this is mostly useful if you are going to be printing uh, your designs. So our next one is the line style panel. So here's a quick definition. So while lines will default to be displayed in red, like you see here, you may alter the lines to any desired color. So let's change the color over here. You can change it to purple. Altering line colors will not affect their properties in how they may cut. Altering line colors may be helpful to allow you to more easily view different images or image parts to see lines in whichever color you may prefer to view them. So if I drag it out here, I can clearly see the square and this red circle. However, if I make them both red, it may be harder for some to distinguish the two. And it is also easy um, to adjust image parts specifically with printing in mind for the print and cut jobs, where it may be important that line colors are selected to be printed. And you adjust the same way we change the fill colors. You may also adjust the style of your line. Uh, this, the default one is to be solid, but you can also change so that it is a dashed line. You can change the thickness of it. And when you change the thickness, you have added features. So let's change this back to a solid line. So you can change the corner to make it round make it flat, or make it sharp. So let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay, now that we are zoomed in, you can see the difference. You can also change the end caps. So let's draw a line, change the thickness. So here we have a round end cap, square, and flat. And you can also change the position. So here we have the outline behind the shape, and we can change it so that it is in front of the shape. And that's pretty much all you need for the line style options. Okay, so I just went ahead and deleted everything that I had here because I wanted to talk about the next one. And the next one is the trace panel. And this one can get a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna just walk you through it. Okay, so to understand what the trace panel is, know that image file formats, apart from using ready cut files that you can download or purchase from the store or from other makers and websites, you can also import other vector and raster file formats. You can trace these images to create cut lines. The following additional file types can be imported. Silhouette does say that they cannot guarantee the quality or success of fonts or even these cut lines from imported images, and I will show you what they mean by that. So let's say that I wanted to import this image of an apple. So I'm just going to copy and then I'm going to paste it on the Silhouette Studio. Okay, so paste, and I'm just going to size it and make it bigger. Okay, in order to trace it, we have to open the trace panel, and then we're gonna select trace area. This will allow you to draw a box around the area of your imported image that you want to trace.
Once you've drawn the selected area, you can adjust it or move it. So here I am adjusting it, moving it. And that looks okay. The trace area will show you a preview of the original image. And you will also see some yellow to show your trace. A good trace is when most of the parts of the image that you want traced are filled in with yellow and the lines are crisp and clear. The yellow will be applied according to the trace settings filters that are currently set. These filters allow you to make changes to how it will trace the image. So let's go over them. We're going to go all the way to the bottom where it says trace style. The first one is trace. This option will provide a line around all parts of the yellow preview area displayed. So let's go ahead and click trace. All right, so it looks like not much happened. However, if you click on the image and you drag it out, you'll see what happens. Now we have created all of these cut lines. Let's zoom in. Everything that you see in red would be cut. Zoom out. Okay, so I'm just going to select this and I'm gonna make it smaller. I'm gonna move it over here. Okay, our next one is trace outer edge. So we're gonna select the trace area again and draw our box. This option will create a trace line around the outer edge of the yellow preview area displayed only. And it will ignore any of the inner parts that may be displayed in yellow and may also be traced. Okay, so let's click on that. And again, we're just gonna drag it out. I'm just gonna make it smaller and put it right next to this one. Okay, let's zoom in. And as you can see, Because it only traced the outer edge, we don't get all of these little specks on the inside. Zoom out. Okay, our next one is the trace and detach. So we're gonna select the area again. This option will trace the outer edge of the yellow preview areas of the image and detach them from the rest of the background of the image. Okay, I've deleted all of that and now I have the apple again. So now I'm gonna show you how to change these filters here. So the first one is the threshold. So what we're going to do is select trace area again. With the threshold, you can change how the trace filters are applied. So again, a good cut line means that there's more yellow and the lines are crisp. So this is actually a better start than what we had before. Okay, let's go back to how it was. Okay, now we have the high pass filter. Trace lines will start on the outside and make their way to the center of the image. Okay, the next one is scale and you can scale the trace up and down. So you will need to adjust all three for each image and see what works best. So I'm going to change the threshold because all I want is the outline of the apple. Now you can click outline, trace outer edge. And now we have the outline of the apple. However, if we zoom in, the lines look kind of choppy and jagged. 
and it's not the best. The lines aren't smooth. So that's what they mean that they can't guarantee the quality of the cut lines if you use an image that is imported. However, that doesn't mean that you can't get a quality uh, cut line from an imported image. You just have to know which ones you can use. Okay, you're probably asking yourself, what can we trace? Black traces are the best. We are looking for high resolution images. If they are pixelated, it will trace those pixels. So low resolution images will make uneven lines. All right, so let's say that I wanted an outline of a panda. I would have to search for those images so that I can import it here. I'm gonna show you different images that I can use and how that affects the quality. All right, so let's just say that I was going to use a regular photograph and I wanted an outline of this panda here. Pretty good quality photo. So let's see what happens when I trace this one. I'm going to copy and paste into Silhouette Studio. Okay, so I'm just going to trace it. And this is what we get. We can change the filters here and mess it around with the threshold. However, we're not gonna get a clean outline. To clearly see it, I'm just going to fill it in. Okay, and that is that option. Again, not the best. Just note that every line that is red here that we see, that's what the silhouette will have to cut. Meaning we're not gonna get a, a simple outline of the panda and it's also going to take forever for the silhouette to cut it. Okay, so now I'm going to search for a different image of a panda. This time I will search for one that is in a PNG file format. I usually suggest to search for PNGs because many have transparent backgrounds, meaning it already has an outline and they also are good quality images. Okay, so as you can see, I just searched for Panda PNG and these are the results. Let's say that I wanted to go with this one. This one is, it's clear that this one is, it has a transparent background because we see white here. When we click on it, we see those squares. So when it does have a transparent background, we can't just copy and paste because we will get a black background. So let me show you. Okay, so this is what we get. We get that black background, which might make it harder for it to trace. So let's try it out. Okay, so this is what happened. Because it was all black, it just created the outline of the rectangle. So instead of copying and pasting onto Silhouette Studio, you're gonna want to save this one in your images or pictures folder, and then you're gonna drag it into Silhouette Studio. Okay, and there's the image. As you can see, this is a pretty good quality image. You're just gonna have to size it down. Okay, so here's the image size down. We're just going to trace it. And this is what we get. Because this one isn't just black and white and it also has some detail, it is only picking up on certain aspects of the image. Let's see what happens when we trace it. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. However, we didn't get the outline of the head. I'm gonna just make it smaller and see if there's another image that we can find. Okay, so now we're gonna look for one that has a clear outline, doesn't have that much detail going on on the inside of the image, and it is also just black and white. So 
we have this image right here. Because this one is has a transparent background, we're gonna want to save this one also and drag it into Silhouette Studio. Okay, let's see what happens when we trace this one. I'm gonna fill it in. And it's almost identical to the original image. So these are some options of images that you can look for and that you can trace. It all depends on what kind of project that you are working on. Sometimes you're gonna want to trace the inner parts to create a layered project. This can be trickier and we will talk about this in another video, but the same rules apply. An image that works best is one that doesn't have that many details and it is clear and there are solid black lines. All right, our next tool is the image effects tool. So you would open the images, uh, the image effects panel here, and this is for imported images. This is the same as editing photos. You can change the gray shade, the hue, brightness, contrast, saturation. You can also change the gamma. You can invert it. Change it to sepia. And mess around with the colors with red, greens, and blues. Again, this is for imported images. You might want to play around with these effects in order to improve a trace. In our last video, we went over the textile panel. So let's go over that really quickly. Let me create the text. Okay, to change the style, we'd have to highlight it. And here we can just scroll through it to change the style. Okay, some of the features down here, it all depends on what style you're using. So for this one, I can make it bold. I can italicize it and I can underline it. You can also justify here, justify center to the right or full. You can also change the line spacing and character spacing. In the last video, I didn't talk about kerning, so we can take a moment to talk about that. Kerning changes the spacing especially with kerning pairs. Kerning pairs are pairs of letters that have a specific spacing. Often they overlap. So take a look at T and A. As you can tell, that tip of the T is overlapping with the beginning part of the A. And if I turn kerning off, it'll create a space between each letter. Do you notice the difference? By changing this, you can make your text more appealing. This also depends on the font that you are using. Some of them will look different. See, if you use this font, nothing really happens. All right, so now we're moving on to transform. So we're gonna open the transform panel right here. With transform, you can change the way that your images are arranged. So let me drag this honey pot right over here and see what happens when I click center. It puts it right at the center of the page. The same would happen if I click here, but that's only because there's only one selected. See what happens when I have two images selected. It puts it right at the center However, this one puts both of them right at the center. Okay, if I align left here, it'll drag it off to the left-hand side. Same with this one and that one. If I align center, it's gonna bring all of them to the center horizontally. If I align right, take them, it takes them to the right-hand side. Now the same thing can happen if I align vertically 
So it'll take it to the top. There we go. I can also align middle. And align bottom. To space horizontally, you need a minimum of three objects selected. And it takes the images and spaces them horizontally, so they are evenly spaced from each other. Now let's say if I wanted more space like this. There we go. And if you space vertically, it's the same thing, but now it's up and down. There we go, it's evenly spaced. Here we can change the scale. So you can change it this way, or you can click here and it'll scale it 200%. It'll scale it by 300% and it's scaled it down to 33% or you can just change this here and click apply. You can also specify dimensions and click apply. So let's see what happens. Which is essentially the same if you were to drag this out this way. and this way here you can rotate you can rotate to 90 degrees 180 270 or you can always just customize it here and you can rotate by 45 180 negative 90 negative 45 degrees and again you can customize here and hit apply and move instead of dragging this out you can always just click on the arrows and you can also use the arrows on the keyboard. You can also specify where it moves. And that's how you use the features in the transform panel. Okay, so now it's time to move on to replicate. This is similar to copying and pasting an image. Here's the replicate panel. With the replicate feature, you can create multiple copies and place them at once without needing to copy and paste multiple times and having to place them manually. It creates copies right next to each other to minimize the amount of space that it takes up. So here we can duplicate left. We can duplicate right, down, and up. You can also create rows and columns of copies. So this creates a row of three. This will create a row of four. This one can create a column of three and a column of four. You can also click fit page and it will create a maximum amount of images that will fit in our design space. You can also mirror below near above, mirror left, and mirror to the right. You can also rotate the copies. This creates a rotated copy on top of the original, and this goes up to five copies. If you go to advanced replicate, you can change the number of copies and the position of each copy. So let's say I wanted five copies and I want each copy to rotate negative 33.0 degrees. If you click object on path, you can drag the selected object onto another shape using the grab handle. And here you can change the settings to how many duplicates you want. And then watch what happens when I drag it over to the honey pot. It has now created bees all around the honey pot. So these are just different tools that you can use. Okay, so we've made it to the modify panel. Again, this one can be tricky, but you got this. Okay, so overlapping images may be altered in many ways. The first way that we're going to talk about is welding. So let's open the modify panel here. 
and we see weld up here. When you weld, this will take two or more selected overlapping images and join them together into one single continuous image, like welding two pieces of metal. Welding can be useful when cutting so that the cut lines don't overlap during the cutting process. So essentially here we have two objects. We have my scoop of ice cream and we have my cone. If I overlap my scoop of ice cream with the cone, it will create one continuous form. So to do that, we have to select both images and click weld. So what happens if we bring this one to the front? And we click weld. We still get the same thing. The same thing applies with text that has overlapping lines. So here I have typed up welding. As you can see, and I'm gonna zoom in, the E and the L have overlapping lines, and so do the other letters. So these are all grouped together. If I right click and I click ungroup, we'll see that these are all separate letters. Okay, look what happens when I click weld. Because these had overlapping lines, they all welded together. And now this is its own separate object. This is helpful when you are sending something to cut. If you didn't weld the letters together, then you would get the E and the L cut off and also the rest of these letters. Okay, now we're going to subtract all this option will remove any portion of an image that is in back or behind another image. So we have both of these selected and we're gonna click subtract all. And see now that it removed the part that was overlapping but was in the back of the scoop of ice cream. Okay, we went all the way back and we have our two original shapes. Okay, now we're going to hit divide and this option will create individual images from the intersections of up to eight selected images. So let's select both and hit divide. So I cut it right here at the top of the cone. I cut where it overlapped and it created that curved line. Okay, now we're moving on to subtract and this option will remove all overlapping parts of images that it that are in front of other images so that only the image located in the back will remain with the overlapping parts removed. So this part should be removed, the overlapping part, this part should be removed and we should only get, have the cone. So let's select both and subtract. And there you have it. All right, let's go back. Okay, next is intersect. This option will leave only the overlapping part or intersecting part of the selected images when applied. So it should only have this part right here where it overlaps. Yep, and there we have that. Let's go back. Okay, with crop, this option will remove all areas that are not shared by at least two shapes when overlapping. Can you guess what we're going to be left with when we click this? Okay, let's see if you're right. Did you get it right? Okay, let's see if we move it this way. Okay, so how is this different from intersect? Okay, let's create another scoop. Okay, look what happens when we intersect. It's all gone. However, when we click crop, we are left with these two. Okay, now we have the compound path tool. This tool will take overlapping embedded images and either make them into a compound path or release the compound path. This is super important to understand. Okay, let's take a look at this example. I have two butterflies and they both look the same but one of them has the spots on top of another and the, and the other one has them embedded. So let's color it in. Okay, do you notice the difference? Take a look at this image right here. 
Look at the non-compounded image versus the compounded image. You notice that in one, it has the spots on top of the, the other, and the other one has them embedded. Same with this one. So let's take a look at what happens when we ungroup. Now I can just move these shapes right here. However, I can't do the same with this one. Okay, so this is the same image unfilled. Now all parts are grouped together. If this is a non-compound path um, and the image is filled with a color, this will be the result. Even though grouped together, all line sets are still just individual pieces lying on top of each other. So they are filled with the selected fill effect. If the image has a compound path and it is filled with a color feature, this will be the result. The unfilled parts of the image cannot be filled with compound path images because these embedded areas are negative space. Compound paths can still be ungrouped to move multiple image parts around, but the action of ungrouping will immediately release the compound path and make it a non-compound path image. To make a series of multiple selected images a compound path, you may right-click until the multiple parts are all selected and select Make Compound Path. Similarly, you may right-click on Compound Image and select Release Compound Path. These options may also be found in the Object menu, so up here. So let's say you only wanted certain shapes to be made compound path. So you would select this one, you select the entire butterfly, and this one down here. So now you have only created these to be to have a negative space. You also have the option to detach lines. When images are filled or half thick lines, this may be used to detach and move the outline to create two separate images one with just lines and one with just the filled effects left behind. There you have it, you have one that has an outline and then you have one that has the fill effect. Okay, I deleted everything else and I made a trace of a cat. So now we can take a look at the offset options. You open the offset panel here where the star is. You have two options. The first one is to offset the selected shape and this will create an outline of the image. The second option is to click internal offset and that will create inner lines. So this one was our original and this one was with the internal offset. And you can adjust the distance and make the corners sharp or round. So we have learned all of these tools. We still have these four at the bottom, but we're gonna skip these because they are either not for the Cameo 3 or 4, and also they are for specific projects. So again, we're gonna skip these for now. All right, now you learned a lot of tools and you are ready to put them into practice. Let's create another bookmark using some of these tools that we learned in this video. So as I said, we're going to create a bookmark using some of the tools that we learned in this video. This is the bookmark that I created. So we're gonna go ahead and create one together and you're going to customize it to however you'd like your bookmark to look like. The first step is to create the bookmark shape. You can create any shape that you'd like. However, I'm going to stick with the one that we did in our last video. I'm just going to speed up the process. If you'd like a refresher on how to create the bookmark shape, you can go back to the first video.
To make the points at the bottom, instead of making compound path using the eraser tool and then dragging out that shape, I am just going to use subtract. Okay, let's take a look at that again. I have opened the modify panel. I have both items selected and I'm just going to hit subtract. At the top, I'm going to add a fox. So I am going to search for a fox PNG. Okay, here I've searched for fox black PNG and I'm going to use this one. I'm going to save it and then I'm going to drag that image into Silhouette Studio. So if you want to do the same and add a shape to the top of your bookmark, you're going to want to use to look for an image that has most of its shape filled in with black. Here are some of the options. Our next step is to trace your image. Select trace area. And trace. Move this one to the side. To clearly view it, you can fill it in. I'm just going to change the colors. Your next step is to size this down so that it fits on top of the bookmark. I can use the arrow keys on the keyboard to move it up a little bit. Okay, we have to make sure that it overlaps. Can you notice that it is overlapping? Okay, I'm gonna zoom out. Okay, now I'm going to select both and we are going to weld the two together, meaning that now it's going to be one continuous shape. So we can right click and click weld. There you have it. We have the top of our bookmark attached to the rest of our bookmark. Okay, now for the inside of the bookmark, I'm going to create somewhat of a stencil. I'm not going to add text. Instead, I'm going to search for an image of a mushroom. Okay, and this is the one that I'm going with. I'm also going to save this one and then drag it into Silhouette Studio. Now, if you are doing something completely different, just make sure to choose something that is simple. So here are some examples. You're going to trace this one also. Next is to place it on top of the bookmark. So I'm gonna make it smaller. Okay, now you're gonna create a compound path. So you select both and you can go here to create compound path. You can also right click or you can go to object. Okay, now that we have made compound path, we have something that looks like this. If we were to send it to cut, all of these little pieces would also be cut off and we would be left with something like this. If this is how you'd like your bookmark, just with the outline, that's okay. But again, I said that I wanted something that looks more like a stencil. So there are extra steps that we need to take. In order for these to not be detached, I have to attach them in some way. I can do this by creating a shape that will connect all of these parts and the stem of the mushroom to the rest of the bookmark. Okay, so what I'm going to do is create a circle. Now I'm going to access the edit points. So I can just double click. I'm gonna drag this part upward like this. I'm gonna size it down. Okay, let's zoom in. Okay, I'm gonna click again. And I'm gonna drag these parts out because I wanna make sure that all of these are connected to this shape that I have here that is also connected to the rest of our bookmark and the stem. If I fill it in, you can see what I mean. Okay, now I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to select both the bookmark 
and this shape and I'm going to weld. So you can weld by right clicking on your mouse and clicking weld or we can go to weld in our modify panel. Okay, so now all of this is connected, but we still need to connect these. So I'm going to create more circles. And see how I am covering just enough of this shape with the shape that I have created. I'm going to fill it in and weld it again. And I'm going to do the same with the rest. Okay, now it is all connected. I also wanted to add some flowers and some polka dots. For the flower, I typed in flower outline black PNG. And there's a lot of options that I can choose from, but I'm gonna go with this one. Because I don't want the inside of the flower, I just want the outline. I'm gonna click outline and then trace outer edge. Okay, now I'm gonna make sure that I size it down so that it fits inside the bookmark. That's a good enough shape. So we can always control C and then control V to create multiple copies or we can go to replicate. So I want to create four flowers and I also want them rotated so they all don't look the same. So I'm going to hit rotate three copies. So now I have one, two, three, four flowers. And I'm just gonna place them here. I'm gonna make them different sizes. Okay, now I've placed them where I want them and I'm going to select all of it and make compound path. And like I said, I wanted to create polka dots. So I'm gonna create a circle to create a perfect circle, you're gonna wanna hold down shift. Gonna make them smaller. Okay, here's my circle. And again, I can make multiple copies by opening up the replicate panel. I can rotate copies or I can also create rows and columns. And I'm just gonna place them on top of the bookmark. Okay, I have placed all of my circles on top of the bookmark. The last step is to make compound path again. Okay, there you have it. My bookmark is now complete. There are so many ways that you can customize your bookmark. Well, I hope that you continue to play around with the new tools that we learned in this video. In our next video, we will be covering materials, hardware, and how to send our first cut. So I hope that you will join me for the next video. Goodbye for now.